Hi, I'm Corey Turner with the NPR Ed Team, and I'm here to talk today about America's high school graduation rate. Uh, you probably heard, or maybe you heard, uh, earlier this week, President Obama talking about how the graduation rate for the U.S., high school graduation rate, just hit an all-time high, 83%. It's good news. Uh, President Obama and even before him, uh, President Bush put a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy into raising that rate nationwide across states. Um, that said, I'm here uh, in large part to talk about why in many cases that good news is just too good to be true. Uh, so I'll give you just a couple of minutes of preamble and then I'm happy to field your questions, okay? Um, last year, the NPR education team uh, spent about six months with a lot of help from our member stations investigating high school graduation rates across the country. And what we found were states and districts really doing three different kinds of things to improve their grad rates. Some of them were good, and some of them were really not good. Uh, we'll start with the good stuff. In fact, we'll just call category one the good stuff. Um, these were uh, proactive, meaningful interventions at the student level where schools were really doing a good job of keeping track of their at-risk students, the kids who were most likely to drop out, and giving them access to more resources, counselors, teachers, whatever they needed to stay in school. When it's done right, it works very well, and some states and some districts have gotten very good at it you know, increasingly. Category number two, though, is uh, exact opposite of that. It's what we call gaming the system. Um, most of you probably heard about the cheating scandal that unfolded in Atlanta where some teachers were caught actually erasing or changing uh, student answers on standardized tests. As part of our big reporting project last year, reporter Becky Vivi of member station WBEZ in Chicago found that some city officials there were actually mislabeling dropouts. Now, that isn't to say that they were doing it intentionally, necessarily, but still they were mislabeling dropouts, and so thousands of kids who were essentially dropping out weren't being counted against the city's graduation rate. Um, and then, it's not quite gaming the system, but category number three we call lowering the bar. Uh, the nonprofit Achieve has spent a lot of time studying this issue. Um, Achieve reports that increasingly states seem to be either dropping their graduation exam entirely or in some cases actually watering it down. So instead of testing students at a 12th grade level or at least at a 10th grade level, uh, in some cases they're doing it at a 9th or an, even an 8th grade level. Um, also, Achieve reports that roughly half of states now offer multiple diplomas. So it's, it's no longer you graduate from high school, you get a diploma just as you know, a student 50 miles away or 200 miles away. In many cases, states are offering two, three, four, even five different kinds of diplomas. And the problem there is that some of these diplomas are a lot easier to get than others. And in many cases, states don't have to be very transparent about how many students are getting each kind of diploma when they report their graduation rate. And, um, the big problem here is that this is starting to show up some in college remediation rates. Um, increasingly, um, we're seeing more and more students show up on college campuses and they're just not ready for college coursework. And the, the real problem there is that when they have to take remedial courses, you know, these don't help them graduate from college. They cost them money and they take them time. Um, and that's really problematic. So, you know, the next time you hear a politician celebrating the high school graduation rate, it's okay to celebrate. It is good news. And there has been a lot of hard work um, to going into this, this new all-time record high grad rate. I don't want to be a total wet blanket. But it is also important that we make sure that a high school diploma means something, that it stands for something, that U.S. employers know when they get a high school graduate that that diploma is meaningful and will translate in the workforce or whatever it is these students decide to do. And we need to make sure that we're not just setting students up for failure once they get out of school. Uh, so that's my, that's my preamble. Uh, I'm happy to take your questions. My colleague Kat from the Ed Team is staring at a screen right now. And uh, hopefully you guys will, will throw some stuff at me. I'm happy to talk about our older reporting from from last year, there was lots of really interesting stuff there. One thing I didn't mention in my preamble is something that, that really fascinates me. It's a bit nerdy, but you know what? If you're watching this, you're probably an education nerd like me. Um, and that's online credit recovery. 
which is something that we see in lots of districts today. I know um, I've seen it, um, all of my colleagues on the ed team have seen it increasingly, uh, where students who you know, may take six months to fail out of, say, Algebra, Run, Algebra 1, which is a big gatekeeper these days, um, can instead take the course online. Um, it may, not in all cases, but in many cases, it's easier and takes less time for those students to get that credit and keep moving. Um, so, Kat, I don't know, do we have any questions yet, or? Not a lot of questions yet. All right. Um, general question, uh, do you think a high school diploma still means anything? General question, do I think a high school diploma still means anything? Um, you know, it's a good question. It's, it's really the fundamental question that drove us to start investigating last year, because we kept hearing stories about things districts were doing um, to pass students who just clearly weren't ready for, you know, for college or career. Um, and, you know, frankly, to be, <laughs> to be honest, a lot of this stuff is probably driving inflation in the college market. You know, we, we keep talking about how college prices are skyrocketing and, and access to college is getting tougher and tougher. And, you know, the problem is that I, I think increasingly a high school diploma doesn't mean anything, or it means a lot less than it used to, because there's just so much variation in the quality of the diploma. You know, I mean, when we did our grad rate series last year, um, we heard from a lot of people outside the school system, um, some, you know, in the workplace, folks just saying, look, I, there, there's just no quality control anymore. There's no guarantee that, you know, someone who comes to me, an 18-year-old who comes to me who has a high school diploma, there's no guarantee to me um, that they have the literacy skills of a fifth grader. Um, so, I guess short answer, no, although I gave you the long answer. Um, do you think, or have you found any uh, evidence of the system, the school system supporting high school students from the ground level, is what someone's asking me, like from K up through 12, huh. to be better high school students? Um, yeah, so this is a this was a big talking point for the Obama administration has been, and frankly, um, if you watched the presidential debate last night, um, Secretary Clinton mentioned this. Uh, there is a there is a big emphasis these days on the power of preschool, and and the importance of preschool insofar as laying the groundwork for student success many years later. Um, in fact in his speech earlier this week touting the new graduation rate president obama one of the one of the first things he highlighted in his speech was his uh, i think he said he had expanded the roles of head start by 60,000 kids and he had pushed gosh uh, i think he had pushed something like 10 more states to offer some level of state funded preschool so it, it's clear there there is a lot of a lot of movement towards high quality preschool, not just because high quality preschool in the moment is is probably a good thing, but because um, it it will help give students a firm foundation that ideally will pay dividends five, ten, fifteen, twenty years later. Um, have you seen any evidence that this grade inflation essentially will continue on into college or graduate school? Make those degrees less meaningful? Um, that's a great question. Um, the question was whether or not we've seen any evidence of this kind of grade inflation beyond high school and into college. Um, frankly, my beat is largely pre K through 12. I don't spend a lot of time studying higher ed, so I couldn't say with any real conviction. Um, what I do know, though, is that we have seen. Um, we have seen uh, remediation rates are kind of hard to measure, and so there's, there's not a, a really good sort of standard for remediation rates. But we, but we have heard anecdotally from lots of different places and seen evidence from lots of different places of remediation rates on the rise. And, th and this is just bad news for students because, you know, the moment a student has to walk into a remedial college course, they're less likely to graduate. You know, grade inflation aside, you know, the moment you have to pay money and spend time taking a course that's not going to help you earn your college degree, you're in trouble. Uh, and that's not a good thing. Um, can you talk a little bit about student migrancy and what districts are doing to identify and record it, if you know anything about that? 
Student migrancy. So, <clears throat> you know what, Kat? Can you repeat the question? Or actually, whoever posed it, can you, <laughs> can you type it with more specificity? I mean, would charter schools help this situation? Uh, the challenge there is that uh, I don't think, I, even proponents of charter schools, I think, will admit that charters don't have a silver bullet when it comes to, you know, the really hard, gritty challenges to educating, you know, America's kids. Like, it's, it's just a, it's a complicated challenge. I don't think, um, uh, I don't think that charter schools are necessarily or inherently better equipped to do it than traditional publics. And frankly, you know, so many charters are operating within the traditional public system. Um, I do want to say, actually, going back to the question I just asked for a repeat on, because one story comes to mind. It was one of the first, it was one of the first stories um, I helped edit when I joined the NPR ed team. It came from a colleague I respect very much who's not in Miami anymore. It was a um, reporter. Actually, she may be back in Miami. I can't remember. A uh, reporter, Sammy Mack. Uh, it was a great story. You, you should look it up if you're interested. Um, just go to NPR.org and search Sammy Mack, Miami, maybe student data. Um, and it was, she was talking about or reporting on this really interesting effort. I believe it was in Miami public schools. Um, where they were using data in a very creative, proactive way to really follow students. And she described like a, um, um, almost like a war room where teachers and counselors would get together and they would um, regularly, on a regular basis, um, run through profiles of students who they considered in trouble, who were raising red flags in their system, and then talking through options, things they could do, you know, before these kids drop out. And it was clear that if I'm remembering correctly, that this was a district-wide effort. And I know Miami's not alone. I've heard stories of this kind of, this kind of district-level data-intensive intervention in lots of different places. Um, so I assume as long as a student is migrating within a district, especially if we're talking about a large urban district, um, I would hope that that sort of system would follow them, although it probably varies from school to school and system to system. We have one person ask a question who is a, a, an adult teacher for high school completion. Um, she says that many students come to her with learning processing uh, issues. Would better screening for that kind, those kind of issues help the graduation rate? Hmm. Um, so the question was from a teacher of adult students, um, presumably working towards their um, actually working towards their GED or working towards their high school degree um, and asking because so many students he or she sees have some sort of learning disorder whether or not early screening would help improve graduation rates. Um, again, it's a complicated question. It's a good one. Um, it actually uh, reminds me of a fantastic piece of reporting that I saw just a couple of weeks ago and if you haven't heard about it, you should be sure to check it out. Um, from a reporter uh, uh, with the Houston Chronicle um, reporting on um, special ed rates in Texas. And what he found is that while the, the, the generally accepted incidence rate of, of special education is roughly 13% thir nationwide, um, for some reason the Texas rate was much lower than that. And he really pushed on this notion that Texas had been pushing for a while that, well, that's simply because Texas teachers and its districts were doing a really good proactive job of intervening, intervening on behalf of kids um, before they needed really intensive special education services. And um, what he reported uh, was really a, a, a sort of um, uh, imposition of, of this idea from the top down onto districts that, you know what, they it, it was they were discouraged from providing special ed services to too many kids. They really wanted to, to keep a lid on that, and and in that sense, yeah, it really it really makes me wonder about all of the kids who ended up working their way through the system, or hopefully not, but presumably falling through the cracks of the system because they weren't being diagnosed. 
um, because they weren't getting the services that they needed, because they weren't getting an IEP. Um, so anyway, I encourage anyone who missed it, again, this isn't NPR, this was Houston Chronicle, but it was an amazing piece of reporting. Great piece. Check it out. Uh, one person's wondering if you think re reintroducing vocational uh, training in schools would help, kind of like auto, <coughs> auto classes and that kind of stuff. Great. Uh, I love this question. Uh, the question was whether or not I think um, it would help um, reintroducing vocational ed or, <laughs> it's funny, I did a story on this uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago, how uh, uh, even the phrase voc ed or vocational ed is frowned upon um, when you talk to schools or school leaders or folks in the voc ed um, arena. It's now career tech. And the short answer is yes. Uh, for some reason, this fascinates me, for some reason the U.S. at some point, um, really in decades past, probably, I don't know, 20 years ago, um, I'm just making that up, sorry. <laughs> but at some point we really got away from the idea that career tech um, is a meaningful, dignified pathway for students. Uh, I, I, and I'm not sure why we got away from that idea. My best guess is that at some point um, we convinced ourselves that every child should be going to college, that every child wanted to go to college, and that it was in the best interest of every child to go to college. And the interesting thing is if you compare the U.S. education system to many of the European systems, and Germany is the first that comes to mind, you know, Germany has a really robust career tech system. Now, I will say that part of what makes it so robust is very early tracking. You know, in the early two, second, third, fourth grades, send, sending kids down very specific pathways. And, I mean, frankly, that, that feels very un-American, um, which, again, may be one reason why career tech is, is still struggling to, to get a foothold or struggling to, to, to resurge. But I do think, actually, in the last five years or so, I know the Obama administration has, has really been big on career tech and making it respectable again. Um, you know, really trying to work with um, big, important industries that are part of a 21st century economy, you know, giving students the skills that they need. You know, it's not just about, like, teaching students how to repair a car. You know, it's about... Um, Lots of other things that, you know, career tech of 20 years ago couldn't even dreamed of. But the challenge here is we, we somehow need to, to translate those skills and how to teach those skills to our high schools. And sometimes it even varies regionally. Like, to, it, I've heard stories, I mean, it seems to me some of, the, some of the most vibrant career tech programs in our high schools are the ones that are working hand in hand with their local community college, with their local hospital or nursing program, you know, or in their local industries to figure out what is the need locally and how can we best meet it? You know, I think that's probably the future of career tech. I want to plug, I'm all for plugging journalists who don't work for NPR. Um, uh, a friend of mine whose work I respect very much, uh, Emily Hanford of American Radio Works, has done a ton of work on career tech. So I highly recommend you Google her and check out some of her career tech work if you're interested in figuring out what the hell happened to vocational ed. Uh, Corey, did the ed team find that there were any discrepancies between urban and rural schools in terms of preparation for graduation or college? <clears throat> uh, the question was, did the ed team find any discrepancies between urban and rural districts in terms of uh, how well they prepared students for college? Um, n the answer, to the best of my knowledge, is no. Uh, I'm trying to remember... Um, we actually had reporters from lots of different places, both urban and rural, and, and frankly, I, th I think um, the stories varied. I mean, there are lots of big cities uh, that have, have been doing a very good job of, of trying to meet students where they are, of scaffolding for their at-risk kids, um, putting their best foot forward, really in a good faith effort to improve their grad rates, just as some, some cities haven't. And I think the story is the same in rural communities. It just, it just depends on you know, resources and, frankly, you know, the leaders who are setting the message. Uh, all right, Corey, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I think we're probably going to wrap it up. All right, guys, um, one more question. Here we go. What is it, Kat? All right. Uh, is standardized testing an effective way to determine college readiness? <laughs> 
uh, you saved the best question for last. Is standardized testing the best way to measure readiness for college? Uh, you know what? It's funny. I'm going to get in trouble no matter what I answer. Um, uh, I've reported a little bit on this. Um, I know my colleague, Anya Kamenetz, uh, who wrote the book called The Test. Uh, if you're watching this, Anya, I know she's probably gritting her teeth, waiting to see what I have to say. Um, uh, personally, I would say, and based on the reporting I've done, I would say, no, not necessarily. Um, I'm a big fan of, of GPA and high school work, you know, <laughs> what you did day in and day out and not what you did on the day you showed up for the test. Um, that said, I don't want people to think I'm saying there's no reason for standardized tests. Um, I think there are plenty of reasons um, for the occasional standardized test. Um, that said, uh, you know, I think I think increasingly what we're seeing, especially from colleges and universities, is consideration of a multiplicity of factors. Um, not just how you did on you know, the SAT or the ACT, um, but whether or not you did good work consistently day in and day out through your high school career. And the intangibles, frankly, um, I did some reporting uh, I think it was about this time last year um, on the Obama administration and colleges and universities getting on board, really um, trying to focus in um, on social emotional skills, on um, volunteering in the community, all of these intangibles that you know that won't necessarily show up in a transcript and certainly won't show up on a standardized test. But you know, if colleges and universities really start taking them seriously, I think could could make a big difference for a lot of students who have been doing good work and, you know, <laughs> may have simply had a bad test day. Um, so, anyway, uh, as is true, every time I do this, uh, I, I feel like I've probably left more questions than answers, but feel free to go to um, our page, npr.org slash ed. You'll find lots of great reporting on all of these subjects. Um, you know, these are all perennials. We touch on these <laughs> actually more than once a year, all the time, really. Uh, and do be sure to check out our big project from last year. We call it The Truth About America's Graduation Rate. Um, so thank you for watching and for listening. Again, I'm Corey Turner uh, with the NPR Ed Team. Until next time, take care.